Welcome to Tending the Garden of Our Hearts. I'm Elisa Bielitich Davis. And I'm Christina Wenger. If you've been listening to our podcast for a while, you know that we love to learn from the lives of the saints. We've shared the lives of many saints in previous episodes, and we're so grateful for their example of how to follow God. We like studying their lives and looking for ways to grow to be more like them. We are so excited about this brand new book that Ancient Faith has just published. It's called 101 Orthodox Saints, and it's written by Sarah Wright and Alexandra Schmaltzbach. This beautiful book tells the story of 101 different Orthodox saints, and each saint has their very own page that includes fun facts, related pictures, and beautiful illustrations by Nicholas Malara. Ancient Faith has very kindly granted us permission to share a few of the saints' stories with you. We'll read from the book and then share some of our own insights and impressions, and we'll ask you some questions that you can discuss with your family. This book has a great introduction with lots of interesting information in it. For instance, it has a section about venerating the saints, and this is from page six. Let me read you that section. Scripture and church tradition are very clear that we worship God alone. Worship is most fully expressed when we take the Eucharist at divine liturgy, intermingling Christ's very body and blood with our own. We never worship a saint. Instead, we give them honor and respect. We venerate them as holy people who lived a life pleasing to God. We venerate the saints by bowing before and kissing their icons, singing special hymns to them on their feast days, celebrating their feast days, kissing their relics, which are parts of their holy bodies or sometimes they're parts of their clothing, asking for their prayers, also called intercessions, following their examples of holy living. The church has venerated the saints from its earliest days because it recognized the power of God at work in them. Respect and honor shown to the saints is ultimately respect and honor shown to the God who made them holy. It's so important to think about how we venerate the saints and how that's different from worship. You know, I mean, we all all worship God, but we venerate the saints. It's more like showing them love and respect, right? I, like like if you know a person who's very holy, like maybe you've gone to a monastery and you've met a monk who was really neat, or maybe your grandmother prays a lot and she's really neat, right? So you might ask her to pray for you or you might go give her a kiss. So it's kind of the same thing. And I love how when we are venerating a saint, we're really just venerating God at work in them. And so we're basically giving our love to God by recognizing him in the other person. It's kind of neat because it's like there are just so many roads to get to God, right? Mm -hmm. Like you can worship God directly, but you can also, you know, sort of venerate and send love to God inside of someone in someone because they're icons of Christ, just like we are. It's so cool. It is cool. But we don't want to just talk to you about venerating saints today. We'd like to read you one of the saints' stories. One of the saints that's featured in 101 Orthodox Saints is St. Juliana of Lazarevo. And we find her story on page 65. So on the tab where they have little details about the saints, we see a nice little icon of Juliana of Lazarevo. And we see a little image that shows that she was a mother. And that was really her vocation. She didn't have exactly a job outside of being a mother, which of course is one of the most important jobs. Mm-hmm. And uh, so she lived in the 16th century and her feast day is on January 2nd. And it tells us that she's tied somehow to St. Nicholas. We'll want to listen for that when we hear the story to figure out what that connection is. And she was born in Russia, actually Moscow. And then she passed away in a place called Lazarevo, also in Russia. So that's why we call her Juliana of Lazarevo. So let me read the story to you. St. Juliana was orphaned at the age of six and raised by her grandmother and aunt in a devout home. She was married at age 16 and continued her pious habits of prayer and prostrations while adding the tasks of a wife and mother. While raising her 13 children, she earned extra money so that she could attend to the needs of the poor. This was a difficult time for Russia. 
The rule of Ivan the Terrible was transforming the country from a medieval state into an empire at a huge cost to its people. A famine during his rule brought much suffering, and St. Juliana gave all that she could, even paying for others' burials. After her husband died, St. Juliana used her remaining finances for acts of mercy. In 1601, the worst famine ever known hit Russia. St. Juliana cheerfully sold and distributed all her goods, freed her serfs who wanted liberty, and worked tirelessly to feed those who remained in her household. She was 74 at the time of her death. She asked forgiveness from all and fell asleep, a halo appearing around her head. Isn't that amazing? I think, you know, I thought it was really neat that she loved to do prostrations, which is where you kneel down on the floor in prayer. And she would do those all of her life. I'm just amazed that she had 13 children and she was taking good care of them and her husband. And she still was doing extra work to earn money so that she could take care of poor people. It's not like she didn't have enough work already. I think it would have been pretty easy for her to say, okay, well, this is my ministry now. I'm supposed to take care of these 13 children and my husband, and that's all I can do. But no, she was like, oh, let's see. Those people are hungry. How can I help them too? Isn't amazing. That neat? It's really amazing. Yeah. And they, they use that word famine twice. And famine, of course, is when you know a whole region or a whole country, everyone is just starving right? Like maybe there aren't any crops or maybe there's some terrible tragedy happened in the economy. And it sounds like they were already dealing with a famine. And then another famine came on top of it in 1601, Mm -hmm. the worst famine they had ever known. That sounds just awful. But then there's St. Juliana. She's not depressed or upset about it. She's she's cheerfully selling and distributing all her goods. That's amazing. That That is amazing. Yeah, we say God loves a cheerful giver, right? Like this idea, you know, that like how beautiful that she was just grateful that she had all the stuff she needed to sell so that she could help during this terrible famine. That's That's just amazing. It is. It's a beautiful way to react to it. And so they mentioned that she freed her serfs who wanted liberty and worked tirelessly to feed those who remained. So I think that means she had a lot of serfs. And some of them wanted to go free and some of them wanted to stay. And so she just, if they wanted to go, they could go. And if they wanted to stay, they could stay. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit more about what serfs are? Because we might not all be familiar with that term. Yeah, that's the thing, right? It's kind of unusual. And it's been a long time since there were serfs, thank God. But uh, basically, serfs, they're kind of somewhere between peasants and slaves. So they're poor people. And so you would have like the nobility, the really rich people, the royalty, they would have like maybe a big house and a big piece of land. And then the serfs were the poor people who lived on the land and did all the farming. And they would give part of their harvest to the owner and part of the harvest to themselves. So it was like the owners didn't hire people to work the farms. The serfs lived on the farms and worked the farms for the owners. So it was kind of like being a slave because you weren't really paid and you had to give up the harvest. But on the other hand, slaves usually are will be sold freely. Like they'll just split them up and send them around to different places. But the serfs, like their family lives on this piece of land and they stay with the land. So they get to they get to live in a way where their families are intact. So it's it's in some ways better. But uh, anyway, she had a bunch of serfs and it sounds like she didn't much like the idea of serfdom. But she was just trying to be practical. And so it was sort of like, you know, if you don't want to be a serf and you feel like you can make a better life for yourself, please go ahead. Uh, But if you're worried that if you go out into the world on your own, you're going to starve, then stay here and we'll feed you. And so I thought that was interesting. I I was reading a little bit about serfs in Russia, and it sounds like half of all Russians were serfs. Wow. So like half of Russians were free and half were serfs. And then the other interesting thing is that it sounds like around Juliana's time, that system was just getting started and it wasn't too bad. But then over the years, like over the next 200 years, it would actually get uglier and uglier and sort of more violent and worse. So eventually it ended. It was it was sort of it was a bad system. Wow. I love how it says that St. Juliana worked tirelessly to feed the people who stayed on as her serfs, who stayed on to work on her land. 
I think that's probably pretty unusual because I think most of the people who had serfs under them didn't really work hard to make sure that those people had the food that they needed. But apparently St. Juliana did. I think that's Well, and if you think about it, yes, serfs were workers, right? They were the ones who worked hard to feed the rich people. Yeah. But Juliana didn't mind turning that around and she worked tirelessly to feed the poor people. It's neat. It's actually, it's really, it's really lovely. I also really love how at the time of her death, she asked forgiveness from all. You know, she was a really good person. She was a holy saint. She probably hadn't done much to upset people or to hurt people, but she still asked them to forgive her. She didn't want anyone to have any hurt feelings or, or any troubled minds at all when she passed away. I thought that was really lovely. That is really lovely. And it makes me think about how so often we we ask God to forgive us for the things we've done knowingly and unknowingly. And so maybe it was because of that, that she was asking those people to forgive her, because maybe there were ways that she had hurt them that she didn't realize. And she was asking them to forgive that. Or maybe she had had a bad attitude someday. I can't imagine that because she was so (laughs) cheerful. But I'm just thinking about from my own perspective, I have bad attitudes some days and I need to ask my family for forgiveness at the end of those days because I know that my attitude has hurt them, even if I didn't say mean words to them. So I don't know what she was asking forgiveness of, but I think it's beautiful that she did. Well, it is beautiful and it's humble, right? And Jesus wants us to have humility We're supposed to be humble like he was. And so even though she was really holy, she wasn't like, oh, well, I surely didn't do anything wrong, so I don't have to ask forgiveness. She was always humble till the end, like in the publican and the Pharisee or something where you see someone saying, you know, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner, or I'm the first among sinners, right? So when she was dying, she was so humble that she asked forgiveness from all. And then when she passed away, a halo appeared around her head like a sign from God that she was that she was a holy saint. Amazing. It really is beautiful. It's really lovely. There's a really beautiful picture by Nicholas Malara of, of Juliana just sort of looking like a mom, frankly, like a really nice mom mm-hmm. dressed in Russian outfits. And she's got three of her kids in the picture. I guess 10 of her kids are not seen here. <laughs> well, I mean, the page is only so big, so... <laughs> It's a lot of kids, but uh, it tells us that once while she prayed, St. Juliana was attacked by demons and she called on St. Nicholas to help her. And he appeared beating the demons away with a stick. Amazing. Well, that's the connection to St. Nicholas right ah, there. Yes. Yep, there it is. Well, and wow. isn't it neat to think about how the saints prayed to the saints? Like, yes. it's not just like people and saints and then the people ask saints for help, Right. The saints themselves are people, just like you and me. So they're also asking saints for help. And they help each other, just like they help us. And I just, that's beautiful. And St. Nicholas is neat. You know, when people are in trouble and they have, like, people on a ship that's about to sink, or like St. Juliana here, or I know sometimes in places where there's a war raging and people are, like, shooting at the building or something, people will call out for St. Nicholas, and he's known to come and help in those really dangerous times. He's really a neat saint. We should always keep that in mind. We should. Well, we were talking about venerating saints, and one of the ways we can venerate them is ask them to pray for us. That's right. Trust that they will. (laughs) Yep. And and they will, just like St. Nicholas did. Did you see this quote that she said? Um, it's, It's in the book here, too. It said, when she was bothered by others about her fasting, she replied, Oh, well, whatever my body loses now won't be food for worms later. What's the point of fattening the flesh only to lose the soul? Oh, wow. Isn't that, I mean, that, because that's hard. Sometimes fasting, you know, like, because some, they're just talking about like being fattened versus maybe being really thin, right? So maybe she was fasting a lot. And, you know, when I fast a lot, I feel hungry and I want to eat and I kind of, it's hard not to want to just give your body whatever it wants and just make it feel good all the time. And so, Mm -hmm. but what a beautiful thing that she's saying there, because really your body is just going to go back into the ground, but your soul is going to be up in heaven with God. That is, that's really lovely. That is lovely. You want to tell the fascinating facts that are in the box there? Absolutely. So the first one says when her husband was home, they prayed together and did 100 prostrations each evening. Oh, that's how she continued her prostrations even after she was married. Yeah, she loved him. She loved him. I don't know if anybody does the prayer of St. Ephrem during Lent. Oh, I love that prayer. 
Isn't that great? And there are a lot of prostrations during that one. And so my family has always loved that. But it is outside of Lent, we can be prostrating ourselves as well. And we can be doing prostrations with our prayers. And it really is, it's just, it's a very humble posture for prayer. I think it's really good for us. But gosh, a hundred prostrations, that's good exercise too. <laughs> that is good exercise. <laughs> so the it also says that the Russian famine from 1601 to 1603 was so terrible that about 2 million Russians died, equaling about one third of the population. Oh, that's a lot of people. That that's is an awful lot famine. of people. That is a terrible, terrible famine. That's a lot of people starving. Well, may their memory be eternal. Um, and thank God for people like St. Juliana who were trying to make it better. Yes. Okay, one last fascinating fact. 10 years after her burial, St. Juliana's body was found to be incorrupt and smelling of myrrh. She was recognized as a saint in 1988, the 1,000 year anniversary of the conversion of Russia. Wow, Christianity is so old in Russia. It's over a thousand years old now. In 1988, it hit 1,000 years. Amazing. Wow. And she was incorrupt. You know, she said, whatever my body loses now won't be food for worms later. Guess what? None of it was food for worms. <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, that's Amazing. always beautiful when God shows us that someone is holy, that someone is saintly through these signs, right? Like the halo yeah. appearing and through her body being incorrupt and smelling so beautiful. It's not, I think, so much that God just wants us to, I don't know, to be amazed or something that somebody's showing off in some way. I feel like it's because God wants us to know that we can ask that person for help and that hmm. they're going to be really good at helping us. Right. Well, especially St. Juliana. She was always helping everyone. May we all grow to be more like her by caring more for other people than we care even for our own selves. And may we help everyone, even the people that maybe it seems like ought to be serving us. Pray for us, St. Juliana. Wow. What a blessing to learn about this saint. Now, if you want to create a little page about St. Juliana, go to our website, tending-the-garden.com slash 101 saints. And you'll see that we actually have a printable. You can print those up and you could make a sheet about all of the saints by just filling it in. Here are some questions about today's episode. Sometimes people think that maybe when we kiss icons or ask a saint to pray for us, that we're worshiping the saints. Do we worship saints? What do we call our actions towards the saints? The correct word is to venerate. We venerate the saints, which means that we honor and respect them. We worship only God. And when we honor the saints, we're really honoring God through them. The Russian famine from 1601 to 1603 was really, really terrible. Everyone was starving. A third of the country starved, remember that? Oh my goodness. What did Juliana do? Well, Juliana had a lot of stuff, so she got rid of everything. She gave some things away and she sold others, using the money to feed people. She also freed her serfs who wanted to be free, and she worked tirelessly to feed the ones who remained in her household. What very special thing happened when Juliana died, like right before and even right after? Well, when Juliana was 74 years old, she asked everyone for their forgiveness and peacefully died. And then a halo appeared on her head. Then 10 years later, they found that her body was incorrupt and smelled of myrrh. Now, here's something you might want to talk together about as a family. St. Juliana fasted, and she was known to have said, what's the point of fattening the flesh only to lose the soul? Now, we have to eat. We have to take care of ourselves. But St. Juliana also recognized that food can be used to help us to grow spiritually. By fasting and making food a part of her prayer life, she used food to grow closer to God. We know that she was a wealthy woman with a beautiful estate and a big family. St. Juliana could have spent all of her time decorating her house and throwing parties. But instead, she chose to focus on helping the poor and the hungry. Rather than just using her wealth to make her body comfortable, 
she found a way to use it to grow closer to God. Whether she was feeding herself or feeding others, food became a spiritual tool for Juliana. When you think about fasting, do you think of it as a tool that helps you spiritually? What other ways can you find to use what God has given you, whether it's food or stuff or talents and health or time, to grow closer to Him? How can you take care of your soul? You have been listening to Tending the Garden of Our Hearts, Meditations for Orthodox Families with Elisa Bielitich and Christina Wenger. Elisa also hosts Raising Saints and Everyday Orthodox on Ancient Faith Radio, and you'll find her books in our bookstore. Christina hosts Let Us Attend on Ancient Faith Radio and has written for the Orthodox Christian Parenting Blog. While raising her 13 children, 13 children, (laughs) right? Wow. I have a hard time just saying that casually. That's a lot of children. God bless her. Oh, my.